Hey everybody, it's Richard Harrison, Scott Lease here with another episode of the Surf and Sales Podcast. Super, super excited. Um, one of those people you sort of wonder if they would even say yes when you ask, and he did. Uh, Mark Roberge is here. If you don't know Mark, obviously um, very uh, well known from his HubSpot days. Currently though, he's also the managing director of Stage 2 Capital, I think that's right, and then a senior lecturer at Harvard. So aside from just you know, going off and building an amazing company. He's also really working hard to give back to the community that 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 supported him through all those years. So we're really excited. So Mark, thanks so much for joining us. I, I yeah, hope Richard, I come on. I always respond to your emails and phone calls. You do. Richard, you come do. on. You do. <laughs> I know, but you know, you ask people. You know, sometimes you you email people who you know, and you're like, oh, I wonder if they're going to make me go through a publicist or a uh, <laughs> uh, talk to my assistant. Talk to my assistant. Right. Talk to my, we yeah. had we've had two people say they've got to go to legal. You know, like okay. you got to avoid okay. these topics. So you know, so I'm I'm. Okay. I'm and I also don't want to try to take advantage of people, right? Like just because I know yeah. you doesn't mean I want to be, hey man, come on. So, but so we really genuinely, we're really glad you're here. So thank you so much. for oh, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, there are a couple of things we're going to hit on today, a little bit about the presence of what's happening. Uh, we are, we're recording this during COVID. Um, so I think there'll be some interesting dialogue around that. I know you've got a couple of things too, around um, your VC fund that I know we're going to talk about because it, it it's you're filling a gap there and I really do want to spend time there. And then also this really the science of reestablishing growth. Cause I think probably even before COVID you were already thinking that way. And then this hit and now it's like, now you know, everybody's yeah. thinking about reestablishing growth. Yeah. I I've been telling people all, you know, for the last two months that you're almost back to reestablishing product market fit. Right? Exactly. That's, Bingo. That's exactly that, it. That's, so how do you guys see, how do you see that in your world and what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, across the board, I mean, we'll just start with the, uh, the stage two capital portfolio. You know, we've got 11 companies in that now. And right when it hit, I mean, you know, you know how these, these are mostly originally series A investments and some have grown for a couple of years now. Um, but they're, they're founders who, who maybe weren't even working uh, during 08. You know what I mean? So they haven't, they don't have experience with these recessions and, we just had to scramble to just help them. They, they were just calling us like, can, when can we talk? We need help. And just ran Did them you through. See it as a recession though. Like I, people are saying, what'd you learn in 2008 to now? And it's like, there's a little bit of stuff, but there's nothing in the books for this. Shit, fair. It, to say, yeah. I mean, I guess like if we say, uh, what do you do when people start laying people off and cut budgets? you know, as a, as a, as a tech startup, right? It's like, so there's, there are some parallels, I think, to 01 and 08 from that degree, and of course, some differences too. Um, but so we just, you know, first off, help them like make the hard decisions around, you know, ca sourcing up cash, whether it was taking down credit lines, readjusting budgets, some had to go through some layoffs, some, some salary cuts, that's like 101. I think the one where they just don't lean into enough, and you're talking about this, Richard, is like, most people that went through 08 as another time of down economy, looking back on it, had significant regrets of not making bolder, bolder decisions around reinventing themselves, right? And so as human nature, we, get, we just get naturally attached to the investments we've made and to the learning we've made over the last two years. How hard did we work to establish product market fit, to optimize our messaging? And now our buyer, many buyers, I don't think there's any buyer whose mentality is the same today as it was in January. Okay. And so we are, our messaging, our whole strategy, our ideal customer profile and our customer value proposition is not optimal. And so we have, like you said, Richard, we have to, we have to repivot. So we had to work hard to push our portfolio to just forget about that investment unit. Like we've got to rethink ourselves in, in the times we're in. So an example, we had a company that sold into residential real estate um, agents within a week, they, they stood up a, um, uh, they stood up a virtual, um, home show module and it just changed the game. Um, we're in Sendoso, you may know them in the Valley, Richard. So they, um, they, they, they kind of use gift sending to, um, you know, to help with lead flow and, and customer relationships. Well, everyone wanted to send gifts, but guess what? No one's at the office. So yeah. they stood up within a very quick time uh, a module that allowed a recipient to anonymously provide their home address so a gift could be sent. Brilliant. 
right? And so this doesn't stop at like functional product modules. This is messaging, who we call, et cetera. But that was probably the, the most important work is pushing ourselves to rethink ourselves. And whether you're a $10 billion company or a, a, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollar company, um, I, I feel you have to do it. Well, let me, let me ask you this, Mark. Does that trickle down to the individual level? Do all, do all the individual contributors out there need to be thinking about reinventing them themselves? Yeah, and so Scott, sure, sure. on the front line, definitely. I mean, from SDRs to digital marketers to whatever, um, in terms of what you do in your job, yes. And then, um, you know, different flavors personally, right? So of course my students, I had to push them on that too. I mean, God forbid my students are graduating right now. You know what I mean? It's like, um, but yeah, you, you can, you can, you can think about February when you had that hedge fund job lined up and how great life was. And now that's gone. Yeah. Or you can think about that. You just went through one of the most, um, you know, unbelievably experiences of your life with some of the smartest people you ever meet with a wonderful degree with a world that has so many societal problems that you are probably more posi better positioned than 0.001% of the world to help. And you can embrace that. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm just different thinking degrees. About that. I mean, if you're, if you're an, if you're an account executive at zoom, I wouldn't necessarily want to reinvent yourself right now. You're in a pretty good spot. Um, but um, you know, there's, there's different flavors of that. What, what have you been thinking, Scott? Yeah. I've just been thinking about people who, um, you know, in, in our line of work, for example, you know, if you're delivering training and I, I know a lot of people who are like, Oh, I just got to ride this out, ride this out, ride this out. And I'm, and I've been thinking to myself, no, I got to do something completely different right now. Right. And I started, totally. I started thinking about, virtual happy hours and webinars and all these zoom i literally started thinking them as network television I, I was like this is a tv channel now and people are watching tv and so what does a talking head need to do they need to be on tv so i'm like i need to do every podcast i need to be on every virtual happy hour every show and i just need visibility 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 um and so for me that was that was something that i wasn't doing previously that this kind of brought out of me and and you know not that it was like big, bold action, but in my head, it was like, okay, this is a pretty big different step that I might be willing to, uh, to take. So that's yeah, I cool. totally agree with that. You've got to, you know, you, you, whether it's a buyer that you work with, like just because they can't have meetings or whatever, they still want to do certain things. So we have to reinvent ourselves and like the, the experiences and skills that we have, wh what do they mean in this current world order that we're in? So absolutely. Yeah. Steve, Steve Richards has this state, this phrase of, of, you know, go fish where the fish are. Right. Don't right. just know your line in the water. You got to got to know where they are and go fish there. And, and I think that's what a lot of people are, are trying to do. And to your point, Mark, that's what that's what folks are looking at. Just out of curiosity, like because you are at that VC level and you do see the sort of uh, you have a you have the ability to be future minded in a lot of ways. What do you see on that? What are some positive things coming out? Like, are you are you like, oh, I'm really encouraged. You know, this sucks, but I'm really encouraged by the kinds of things I'm seeing. Well, yeah, I think, I think from a societal level, um, you know, there's a lot of speculation that this incident uh, accelerated um, uh, sort of evolutions that were likely anyway, okay, telemedicine, right? Like one of our companies is a telemedicine company. I mean, they're hitting 200% of goal right now. You know what I mean? And like, I think like people are going to, like even when this is over knock on wood, like, why drag a sick patient into like one spot to, you know what I mean? Like, great. Now we've embraced it. Um, you know, virtual campuses, you know what I mean? Like um, even in our space, closing big deals, we're seeing a sale, uh, a shorter sales cycles on big deals because it's easier to get in front of decision makers and get decision making units together. Um, you know, like uh, universal basic income, whether you're a believer or not, I mean, who knows, but like, we have to have some solution to the fact that like, you know, technology and robots will likely be able to do 90% of the jobs that are out there and people still need to eat and have. So anyway, like, you know, these are, these are some of the things, you know, good or bad. I think there's a lot of silver linings there uh, in terms of our adoption of, of, you know, what, what was an evolution for our society. Richard, you're on mute. Yeah. What are you thinking now? What are you thinking on that? So I agree with you. I think it's accelerating a lot of things. Um, I think a lot of things haven't changed and it, and it really is a back to basics. Hey, you, you now 
can get in front of your people. So you now need to be better at what you do because you're not going to have time to waste, right? You've got to be better at knowing your buyer, knowing their pains, asking questions, like the same stuff we've always known. So in some ways it hasn't, nothing has changed um, other than maybe the timeline, right? Like that's about it. And that timeline is directly affected by people just hoarding their cash. Um, yeah. Which is the smart. It's probably like do. an extremity, Richard, you're exactly, I'm like, I'm trying to find like, what is the, what's the new sales model? What is it? What, what's working? Nothing. And it's literally all the best practices that we've been preaching, but honestly, the minority have adopted. You know what I mean? Like, and, and now it's like, you could get by with, you know, like a subpar. Now you don't, now you can't. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's kind of forcing the issue. It's been uh, removing mediocrity or exposing mediocrity totally. everywhere. Totally. You know? What's different though is I see, you know, in every recession, it exposes mediocrity. Um, but what I'm really seeing is that the old school businesses who are already two generations behind, right? The legit fortune folks are forced to adopt, right? Like my, you know, my kids, teachers, like I don't think I've ever seen a peer, a, a group at, at that level who are often over 40, you know, aren't coming from the tech mind like the three of us are. And they had to adapt to like tech in like weeks, right? And I'm really proud of what they've been able to accomplish. I hope they can leverage that. And you know, all they gotta do is say, great, you don't wanna pay our raise. You know, we'll go on strike, man. You know what that's like, go for it. Here, here's the lesson plan, you go do it, right? Um, so I, I think that's, that's really interesting. Let me change, change the topic on, on you real quick, Mark. I, I have said that one of my biggest regrets in my career as, as a sales leader is that I never attached myself to a company that was led by somebody with the sales or marketing uh, background. So I've always, I've always, had, always had a founder that um, candidly just like struggled to understand sales and, and how to put together a scalable kind of sales engine. And the founders were you know, engineers or finance kind of folks. So in, in your work now, um, I mean, how are you, how do you educate some of these non-sales background founders to better understand, understand the sales people, the sales leader, the sales process, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I get, I'm, I come from a very blessed accidental position there, honestly, um, because of my roots as an engineer. Right. So I was a mechanical engineer undergrad in the first two years of my career. I wrote code, um, you know, being at, at MIT is very quant mindset. Um, and so like my book sells the biggest amongst product and uh, product founders in San Francisco, because <laughs> they're kind of like they've well, always seen. You're, sales you're as like, like, yeah, you're this like unique. Yeah, I'm like them, but they, yeah, you're like, you're yeah, like and, and kind of, so they really relate to it. You know what I mean? I'm very lucky that my brand is relatable from them and they do pr listen to me more than a purebred, like I've been at Oracle for 20 years type of thing, right? And also my approach, right? My approach being very data-driven, very process-oriented that they can relate to because we have, we've been trained to think of a, a very similar way. Um, so, um you know, because they kind of have like the valley's gone through like different ways of like you had like the first wave of software companies in the like 90s potentially that were very enterprise sales driven. And then, you know, here comes like Google and like the product movement, like all of a sudden like product people were in charge. And it was like, why? It was like, if we build it, they will come. Like, why do I need sales people? And why would I, why would I pay a salesperson $250,000 a year when I pay my engineers, you know, 150, it like, doesn't make any sense. And that's correct. I mean, this day and age, I, I, I do think the top engineers should make more than the top salespeople, to be honest with you. And they, they do in a lot of cases. Yeah, um, but, look at, but look, at how, look at how Zoom just made you know, Google eat their lunch on video platform. Yeah, right? Cause like, yeah know, exactly. You know, there, that there's, I, I think there's a question of not valuing one over the other, recognize everybody's worth that. Right. They work together. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, they've right. gone through ways, right? I think it was like, I think it was like kind of like 2000. It was like in vogue in 05 and like Jay Simon at last and he's one of our investors and he's a friend, but he's always like, yo, we no sales, you know? And that's like the cool thing to say, especially in the Valley. But then like there was this time, I think in like 2010 or so when someone was like, hey, why don't we try, you know, free, you know it, it, they didn't call it product leg growth at the time. I think it was like freemium, whatever. 
But then, then all of a sudden there's this demand of like, oh, we're having a little bit of a slow quarter. What do you think about like dropping a salesperson in on these hundreds of thousands of downloads we get every day? And all of a sudden it's like, Whoa. you know what I mean? So, so it's sort of like we, we're, we're constantly trying to figure out how they blend together, you know? Yeah, but coming back to Scott's question, yeah, how do you right. coach those technical founders? I've worked with them and oftentimes, you know, they are the smartest person in the room. Sometimes I, from my experience, they often want to be the smartest person in the room and they're more interested in figuring out how something is done versus actually understanding it and understanding that you can't do that with a salesperson. You can't, I mean, it's hard to learn sales in a book, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So how I'm do you to channel those? like to a person? Yeah. I'm trying to think, cause I've worked, you know, Drew Houston was my student actually at, I mean, I was his T, uh, TA and got to know him and he kind of had that mentality in the beginning, but now he's, he's, really mature beyond that i'm trying to think of like some of our uh product founders right now because they all have well maybe i maybe, have this maybe a different have question. This weird issue yeah go ahead scott maybe a different question that would make it a little simplification would be like what was the hardest part for you then coming from a engineering yeah. background yeah. to transitioning into into yep. sales and understanding sales like what was what's yeah, the sure. what's the hard part because maybe that's the hard part for, for yeah. some founders as well. Yeah, I think for me, it was like, you know, I thought it was, I was a, I was terrible show up and throw up. You know what I mean? I was, I was a terrible, like I was just a pitch person. I thought it was like build an amazing deck and just tell the story to as many people as possible. And we have so much evidence from gone and everyone on how broken that is. Now, fortunately, my dad's been a salesperson since he was a 18 selling Cutco knives. And he quickly mentored me um, on, on the importance of discovering pain development and, and, you know, he's kind of Sandler trained. Um, so, uh, so I quickly learned that sales is, is a lot more about, you know, building trust quickly with a, with a, a prospect so that they, and they open up to you and, and using that trust to it open end sequential open ended questions to un, understand and develop pain and then tailor your pitch accordingly. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that's where, so that, that was my struggle, but I think with the product founders, I think they, again, they're just stuck on like, if you build a superior product, people will buy it. And I'm trying to think when I've come across that, perhaps with some students, et cetera. And I just like baby step them, I think. I'm like, you might be right. But like, wouldn't it be valuable to have someone, right now you have your engineers and your product people. And you know, how many, how many conversations with customers do you think you're having every week? You know, it's like, yeah, you know, maybe every product manager talks to a customer every other day. You know what I mean? So it's like, we're having like a handful. What if you could increase that to like 40 a week? how much better would that be for you? You know what I mean? So it's like, it's I a like stepping stone. And that's honestly like the, the ideal first sales hire anyway. Yeah. It's just someone who's almost like a mix between a product manager and account executive. I like the stepping stone analogy. I've, I've sort of told people before, it's you're sort of like smoothing a stone via water. <laughs> like, yeah. That's the speed with which, you know, some of these things like, uh, the change comes about or the light bulb goes off for them. So you, you got to do it little by little. I, I like that, uh, that analogy. And stuff. Yeah. Cause then all of a sudden now they brought this person in, they're like, a, a, they're jowling with the team. We brought the right person in. Who's not like the coin operated salesperson, but they're, they're going to enjoy collaborating with the engineers. And all of a sudden, like the sales are going and the learning is happening. You know what I mean? And like now we've established the foundation for, for a, a codified process and team. Yeah, I want to flip it because the other side to this coin is, you know, even five years ago, the sales leader had to be mediocre at data and understanding data, right? All of a sudden, five years ago, you heard sales leaders dropping the word cohort for the first time. And I'm like, really? Come on. Using the word wrong probably as well. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So do you see that shift happening now with sales leaders where, you know, and, and as you look at sales leaders and, and in, help evaluate for your clients that, hey, yeah, that you definitely need someone who's a closer, but they also really got to understand this process better now. And I know your process yeah. driven anyway, but have you started to see that evolve on the sales leadership? Definitely. And, and honestly, in the entrepreneur community, I think it shifted too far. I think people have put like almost a, an exceptional sales ops person in as VP of sales. And I think that's a mistake, right? So, so it's like, I, I think definitely the, the purebred VP of sales has to be more analytical than 10 years ago but they don't need to have like the sales ops ability to like create the report. You know what I mean? Or like yes. really even understand what, what I'm getting at. They do need to be totally bought in to running a tight process driven, data driven sales org. 
but it's okay if they're not super analytical as long as they know that they need a right hand person, right? Their sales house person, and they need to trust them. They need yeah. to be like, okay, let's optimize the comp plan. Help me. What's wrong with it? How should we think about it? What should we measure? Give me your advice. Let's optimize territories. What are they doing? Like, what's the data telling us? Why is the forecast lower? You know what I mean? They need to be bought into that. And, but at the same time, because the problem with the ops person coming in is like, well, you know, we have to hire salespeople. We have to build a sales playbook. We have to level up in, on enterprise deals. We have to manage them and coach them and lead them. And that's where like the real, you know, data, data centric ops person struggles. Right now we're seeing our first generation real quick, Richard yeah. is Yamini who is at Dropbox. Now she's the chief customer officer at HubSpot, ironically, because I started following her career when she was at Dropbox. She got promoted up to, I believe, CRO or CCO, but she came up through ops because I'm always telling my students, if you really want to be in sales and get into leadership, don't go into sales ops. You can add a ton of value there in year one, but there's no career path to leadership. But that's starting to change with these like, you know, of course, it's going to happen for the first time in a place like Dropbox where like process and data in the sales probably more important than the people leadership. So do you feel like that's because that, you, I mean, I think you're headed right where I was going to ask, which is that revenue ops, right? You know, we just talked to the, to the head of revenue ops over at Clary last week and we were, he was explaining how they sort of sit in between, you know, they they really are the hub and the spoke, right? How, is, is that what you're seeing too, um, in terms of the growth of this revenue? There's some revenue. Definitely. I'm How seeing you... ops being invested in early on. Like some people even say, like uh, re when the first salesperson is hired. You know what I mean? Really early. If you're going to be like product led growth or whatever like that. Well, I, I, and I've, been on the, I've been on the record as saying my very first hire when I go in to become a VP of sales, whatever, is somebody to run sales ops for me. Super early. Like I, super my early. first hire, like boom. Yeah. Right-hand man or right-hand woman yeah. right by my side. Yep. That. We got them in there because it's data focused. And to your point, Richard, it's not sales ops or marketing ops. It's revenue ops because it, it used to be marketing, sales, customer success, but now they're all coming together. And that's you, such an important role. How do you define, and this is really for the listeners, um, how do you define revenue ops, sales ops, and sales? Like where do you, how do you see them based on your, your view into the world? Yeah, I mean, I think the terms revenue, growth, and go to market are all kind of saying the same thing, which means like sales is just take a lead and turn it into a customer. But that's not revenue, growth, and go to market. Gr revenue, growth, and go to market is, is marketing sales and customer success. It's, it's, it's getting the demand, it's converting the demand into customers, and it's converting the customers into successful customers and expanded customers. And that's how, I, that's how I look at the difference between marketing, sales, customer success versus whatever you call it, growth, go-to-market, revenue. Got it. You, I, want, I want to come back to a hiring thing. I, I, I watched your, or I read your Saster interview the other day. Um, by the way, you're, I think you're the first person I've researched before we do our podcast. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was like, I got to make sure I don't ask him these, hey, so what was it like a HubSpot in the early days? Like, if you want, I'm sure that's been written about enough. Yeah. You said that you're not good at hiring, right? You, 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 I don't know if you remember this quote, but you, you basically said, look, I'm not great at hiring um, or, or interviewing or something like that. How do you recognize that in yourself? Um, and, and so how did you sort of solve that problem for yourself, right? Yeah. Like, rather than just saying, hey, you go interview them or hey, let's create a team, like, which is kind of the standard. Um, I'm just curious how you, yeah. how you measure. I don't know if like I was not good at, I was, what I was really bad was, was negative feedback. That's what I was bad at. And Del delivering with, negative feedback. You mean? Yeah. Delivering negative feedback. And I, I had to go through like therapy. We've talked about that, Richard, you know, like, um, you know, cause this all roots into like childhood stuff. Right. So, totally. uh, you can't be, a, you can't be a good leader and not give negative feedback. So I actually had a quota to give at least one piece of negative feedback a day, uh, to my team. Um, and so, um, but that was my big weakness on hiring. Like I certainly in the beginning, you know, I had no idea what I was doing, but grew over time. And like the big thing there that, you know, even I was on a webinar this morning, it's like most hiring managers, the way they approach the hire is like, read the resume five minutes before, and then go into the interview and have them run through the resume. And I mean, gosh, with so much on the line for a good hire versus a bad hire, we have so much to grow in management. And I think you know my work, Richard, that, you know, very much like the who, 
the book, The Who, which I think I found it after I used this process. Um, otherwise, I would have quoted it more. But just very like, take a step back. What is this role? Let's attach this role to um, skills, knowledge, experience. Let's let's really define what those are into a scorecard. Let's use that scorecard to build a hiring process. Who says what, when, how many steps? And and then let's force everyone to use the scorecard. And especially for something like sales, that if we're successful, hopefully we're going to hire like 50 of these a year. Like to have that much predictability and to be able to literally get to the point which we did at HubSpot to run regression analyses of our scorecards, predictability of success. When you're hiring 50 people, 100 salespeople a year, you, you better it. have that science. Okay. You know what I mean? So, so it's really, it's a process and it's also an awareness that um, there is no universal good sales hire for every company. It's only an optimal sales hire for your company and your context, which is what you're selling to who and the stage that you're at. And so it's very dangerous to walk into a, tra a conference and be like, hey, what are you looking for in your salespeople and copy that? Right. Because what are they selling, you know? You think what, kind of things, what kind of things did you measure in that? Just again, I'm trying to give people some tactical stuff. Like as you yeah, guys sure. went through that iteration and after you did some regression analysis, what did you really start to focus in on? Top five, coachability, curiosity, work ethic, prior success, and intelligence. And it was funny that coachability was not even in my first pass, my first theory of the scorecard. It took me about a year of like every time, every six months, I would like take some time to think about the people I hired six months ago and reflect on how they were doing. You know, why is Betty doing really well? And am I looking for that in the, pro in the process? Why did, why did we have to fire, you know, Bob? And am I looking for that? And I kept seeing coachability. Like the rep that was like, hey, I've been selling for five years, 10 years. You know, thanks for the training, but no thanks. I'll be at my cubicle cranking calls the way I know how to do it. So how do you, how do you and, solve for coachability when you're just going through the interview process? Right. I, I have them role play. I, and then I, um, I test a bunch of things on the role play, like consultative selling, the curiosity, their intelligence of how much they've picked up the technical elements of our product, then we stop. Scott, how do you think you did? If you're like, awesome, I don't know. If you're like, oh, you know, I, I did okay. I liked how I handled this objection. I wish I had this moment back because like in every interview, Scott, I give one piece of positive feedback and one piece of needs for improvement. Um, I thought you handled that objection really well on the SEO thing. That's a very sophisticated answer. You clearly have done your homework. The area that I'd improve on your part is diving a little bit deeper into the need. Uh, trying to quantify and implicate it and any ideas how you might do that scott we're having a conversation i'm coaching you five yeah. minutes later great why don't you redo the role play scott right that's that's what i was getting at because i've i've done that before and i was curious if that was a similar strategy that and that's become like i have no idea you never know what you write that's going to just go viral that has just gone yeah. viral and like the these days you, you ask everyone them, what they look for and they all ask for coachability yeah. and i'm kind of glad because i see i see it correlate in a lot of environments does I mean you give them an immediate chance to implement the feedback? That's the only only way to test it in like real time. Um, yeah, and you could do it sequential, right? You do your phone screen. You like the person. Do a role play. Listen, I really want you to work on this thing. In fact, I'm going to send you our training documents. Why don't you read those? And when you come in in three days, we'll do another role play. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, let me let me switch the topic on you a little bit to sales leadership. Um, the average sales leader is in their role, average VP of sales is in their role like 15 to 18 months right now, depending on who you talk to. Um, my last three VP of sales or SVP of sales gigs, I think my average tenure is like 33 months. So I've nice. arguably doubled the average. But okay. what, is the, what is the key in your estimation to surviving? If you're, if yeah. you're a VP of sales right now, like how the, how the fuck do you get out of the first 18 <laughs> months Right, and, and make sure that yeah. you, don't, uh, you don't become on the shopping block or, or walk away. That's a really good question. I've actually never answered that question before, Scott. It's a very good question. Um, first off, I think you gotta play venture capitalist because as good of a sales and sales leader as you, you can't control product and market and you know what I mean? So you gotta pick them good, pick them well. And yeah. I have helped some peers with that. Um, I have a, like, I love, I love freemium businesses that are having trouble monetizing <laughs> as a sales leader. You know what I mean? Cause it's like, I, I've, ha I've had some peers ask me like, yeah, you know, like they're getting like a hundred thousand downloads a, a month and they've got a 
two million people that use this product every day, but they can't figure out how to monetize. I like, go, go take that job. Go take that job. Because like, I mean, that's product market fit. I mean, you got two million people that choose to use your product every day. We'll find a way to make some money off of them, right? So, so it's examples like that. If you gotta, you gotta kind of play venture capitalist and get yourself into the right context. Um, I think like where you can a relationship with the board. You know, like when things go when things go south, um, and and a, a company struggles, the board starts asking, "Should we get rid of the CEO? What should we do here?" And the CEO has one get out of jail free card, and that is firing the VP of sales. That's right? right. So it's like, so like you you know to to have a good relationship there, and also have a good relationship with the board um, to, now what, to now make what, sure that I, I don't disagree with you. But what happens if you're shielded from the board? And you don't get access. Is that that happens? Maybe it's that happens something that happens a lot. Yeah, maybe it's something you diligence when you're um right when you're interviewing. So that, maybe that goes, maybe you're asking, can back, I talk to your book? That goes I back think, to the picker that you were talking about. That's yeah, part yeah. Of, I right, want it. I'm never going to take a VP of sales job if I haven't talked to the board. Never. Yeah. Because yeah. like if they're if I first off I want to and second off just that that realistic expectation. I mean I don't know and I'm I'm trying to do a lot of evangelizing around this because I I feel pretty strongly about it is. I don't know why most entrepreneurs and boards, they, you know, they're sitting there, you got a nice series A company, you had a great year, you tripled revenue from like a million to 3 million, you've got, it's great. And then you do a $10 million series A and the next month they hire 12 reps. Why do they do that? It kills companies. <laughs> how, how, can you, how can you hire 12 reps in one month? When you're a 40 person company with three reps, like I've seen it happen 50 times and 50 times, like there's two reps left after a year. Right. So I need to, I need to talk to the board just to see their take on that. Like, how do you, how do you want to think about scale here? Like, I'd love to you to come in and just like add 10 reps right away. All right. Let me talk you through how that might be challenging. You know what I mean? So I just want to, I need to make sure we walk through some of those, some of those disconnects. So anything else beyond that, like get, get good, play VC, get good at picking the right. Yeah. Hole. Yeah. Then it's your own execution, right? That's, that's the surround sound. Then it's just around predictability, right? Like my, my thing with, uh, you know, the, the cornerstone of my book was my mission and my role is predictable, scalable revenue growth. And I joke with every founder that when, it, when you get to the, the port of your pitch to raise money on your sales strategy, just start with, our mission is predictable, scalable revenue growth. All the VCs are like, this is awesome. I love this. This is exactly what I've been looking for. You know, and, uh, and then, but it's underneath that, it, that was like the machinery that I thought about, which is if I could hire the same successful person every time, predictably using data, and train them in a very quantified model so that my training is very data-driven and provide them with the same quality and quantity of leads each month and hold them accountable to the same sales process that's measured through data and process, that is a factory that produces predictable, scalable revenue growth. So the surround sound, yeah, play venture capitalist, board relationship, CEO relationship, but then that's our job, right? Is to create that, create that predictability. So, how, so I want to, we've, we've had a couple of conversations around this, so uh, might put you on the spot. So um, sorry, but not sorry. No worries. You know, the four year cliff, right? So we know that the average tenure of a VP of sales is 18 months. We know the average tenure of a head of marketing is maybe 27 or 28 months, again, depending on the data. Do you even know where like this whole, you know, four year cliff came from? Because it doesn't really align, you know. Four year vest, you mean, sorry, right? Four year vest on the one year. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, the four year vest on the one year cliff. Do you even know where that even came from? Because it seems very misaligned with no. that growth. I don't know, but I know who will know. It's Tom Nichols. He's uh, one of the, a very famous faculty member at HBS in the Entrepreneur Department. He teaches this class that's so popular called the managerial, something like the history of managerial capitalism or something. And he basically takes all the students back to the 1800s where all this stuff was invented, like, you know, vesting and, and management fees and carry. And he will know and I can ask him. Because when I read that, Tom is unbelievably respectful, but when I read the class, I'm like, who's going to sign up for that? But he's so amazing to be able to see where all this comes from. So you can challenge it to, to your point, Richard. Like, what, where did this come from? So I'll do some digging. I'll see if he knows. Yeah. How do, how do, you, feel, how do you feel about it, though? We, we had a conversation with uh, Max Altshuler, and he was a proponent of, like, stage-appropriate vesting. 
And here's how I, my interpretation of that. My whole career has been spent taking companies from zero to 25 million ARR. I do it in somewhere between two to three years. And that's it. Like, that's what I'm here to do. I'm going to get you from seed stage to series C. And then I really, you know, I don't want anything else to do with it. That's my job. Yeah. Right. So if I do my job and I take you from being worth, I don't know, 10 million bucks to $500 million valuation, how is it fair that I don't realize all of my equity because I didn't stick around for four years? Totally. Totally. Yeah, I, I see that. Um, do you have a I, yeah, I would hope they would make you. I would hope they would make you whole. Um, I don't know. That's that's interesting. Um, and you kind of have to look at that with your with your value. Um, you have to do some more thinking about that. I, I will say that along these lines, where you're poking, um, I, we did something different at HubSpot that I, I try to implement a lot of companies, and it's different than what the most because most when they hire the CRO or whatever they kind of give them their equity and it's sort of expected that that's kind of your equity. Like that's, that's it. That's where you're getting. And there's this big negotiation. I think that's very wrong. Like, how do we know? Like, so what we did at HubSpot was we'd say, okay, you're going to come in and this is what our entry level equity positions are. Now it's a little lower than market as you see, but it's because we give equity every year if you're good. And in fact, like over 50% of our, I don't know if we still do that, but when we were in the, the zero to IPO range, that's how we handle it is I, more than 50% would get re-upped on their equity. That makes a lot more sense to me. Like how, I'm hiring the CRO and I'm going to like give them the right to own like two to three percent of my company, like right out of bat. No, like here's the deal. When the first year I'm going to give you half a percent and or a 1%, whatever. And it's going to invest over four years. And if, if, if in 12 months we decide you're doing a good job, I'll give you another half a percent to 1%. And after that, if you're still here, I'll give you another. Now it's all overlaying. And, and that's how I think we should be thinking about it. I don't know about, I hear your question, Scott, though, and I don't have the solution to that, is how do you get your fair, fair shake if you're, if you're like a, a 10 to $100 million person or something, you know? And, and to some extent, even beyond, just simply because of the fact of like, wait a minute, I just took you from zero to 100 million, which we now know you're going to a billion. You're going to get to that billion for what I did. Yeah. In some ways, it feels like it's worth more than 1%, right? Or 2%. Yeah, so, yeah. It, it's it's an it's a we could do a whole conversation on that I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, I know I know everybody's up against time, so so the one thing we we always like to do at the end, uh, Mark, is is just say, you know, how can we help you? Like what what do you have going on? Um, yeah, sure. Of things that we can help. Yeah, so um, all that stuff. I've got I've been talking a lot about the reestablishing of uh, growth, the science of that. You know, really taking a much more scientific approach to product market fit and what I call go to market fit to to basically answer like, when should we scale? Where should we scale? And how should we scale? And so, you know, feel free to look up that stuff. And also like, it's all on the stage two capital blog. You know, that's probably where you can most help with your, with your folks is um, stage two capital is the first VC fund run and backed by sales leaders. Uh, so our first fund that we raised last two years ago was backed by 97 uh, sales leaders, marketing leaders, um, customer success awesome. leaders from, from most of the unicorns across the U.S. Um, you know, like Atlassian, Dropbox, Zoom, Asana, you know, SurveyMonkey, you name it. Um, we have representation there, Salesforce, uh, et cetera. 98 and 99 again, buddy. We just, we just missed just the cutoff, missed Richard. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, so, yeah, now we're out raising fun, too. Um, it's been going well, actually, despite COVID. I think we've got, like, 50 signatures now, and we're raising a $50 million fund. I think we're around 10 right now. So uh, we hope to have like 200 or so of those folks. And we actually launched the um, Emerging Leaders Syndicate um, because there were a bunch of folks who were, you know, coming up through Gone and Drift and, you know, the next folks who, who can't be an LP and a VC yet, but they will be. And they can contribute to our mission, which is to help these companies with, you know, finding the talent and find it for us to find good deal flow, et cetera. And so um, we basically put them through a, uh, an investing school um, for 12 weeks and we expose the deals we do, we carve out uh, some for them to participate in at like roughly $10,000 checks. So it's pretty cool. Like it's a really, it really gets me up in the morning to be, you know, grooming the next generation of sales leaders, but also helping them bridge to the investor uh, community as well, which I think we need more of. And then if you, you know, for our deals, we usually come in between the seeds and the A's. Um, we, love, uh, we love deals with a remarkable customer attention. 
right? And it sounds obvious, but like I do find that most VCs are focused on triple, triple, double, double, like very top line revenue focused. I'm very focused on customer retention. So if you hit a million or two million in revenue and, um, and you have north of a 85% customer retention, north of 100% revenue retention, I'm very interested, even if you're not doing triple, triple, double, double. That's awesome. Right, you just found your other, like we need Kevin Gaither and Mark Roberge to build a company and just let Scott run it. And like, <laughs> this is, I love it. I love it. Scott's been asking. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, this, nice. is, this is absolutely his wheelhouse. Mark, man, this has been fat. Like I can't even believe we're almost at an hour and like, this has been fascinating and so appreciative of you giving us some time today, uh, particularly during all the stuff that's going on. So thank you so much. We're, we're really, really appreciative. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, man. thanks for organizing, guys. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Richard. Much, much appreciated. And next time you look, you're going you're to have to get down to surfing sales. You've already got the hair. So by all means. <laughs> yes, I'd love to. Where do I get a haircut around here? Mm, you know, right. no one's open. So what can I do? Let your kids do it. That, that would be it. I did. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. I did. I let my 10-year-old uh, give my, he actually shaved my beard off and, oh gave my me gosh. A, and gave me a buzz cut. That looks pretty good. He that did looks pretty good. good. He's yeah. Got, he's got a future, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Mark. Thanks again so much. We All right, guys. Take care.